Hello there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Changing Minds podcast. My name is Owen Fitzpatrick, and today we are going to talk about why we sometimes fall for scams or why we sometimes fall for something or fall for someone, why we fall for stuff and how not to. So what I want to do is offer you some ideas about what are the mechanisms that are occurring in our brain that cause us to say yes when we really should not, or what are the mechanisms that are going on in our brain that make it so that we believe in things that just don't have any reason for us to believe in it. In other words, things that when you think about them with a little bit of cognitive effort, you can realize how ridiculous that they are. So this is everything from why people fall for conspiracy theories, why people fall for what the mass media says, why people fall for scams, why people fall for magicians tricks. I mean, it really, we, we want to explore this whole area. Now, obviously we've only got a few minutes of a podcast to do so. If you want to look more into this, there's a terrific book. There's lots of great books in this, but there's a terrific book that was released recently called Nobody's Fool. It's done by a uh, psychologist, Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and joined up together many years ago for a very famous experiment called the Invisible Gorilla Study. I don't know if you remember that. I don't want to spoil it for you. So just type in Invisible Gorilla Study and then hopefully it'll show you this experiment that you can do by watching on YouTube, you'll find it. And basically it points out to us a form of blindness or kind of blindness that we have. And the example of the Invisible Gorilla is something that magicians for years have used to be able to transform things in front of our very eyes because they're able to master the art of managing our attention. So we don't see what's going on. And they're the greatest magicians out there. I have a very dear friend of mine, Rory O'Connor. He's so good at magic that when he does what he does, it's impossible to see when he's made the shift or when he's made the change, whether it's mentalism or his magic with cards. True great magicians tend to have that phenomenal skill or that phenomenal ability. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore some of the most important things that I think you need to understand. And this is also an area that I've spent many years researching. As many of you know, my main area of focus is what I call belief leadership, and that is mastering the art of being able to cultivate belief. And to do so, obviously we have to be clear about how we are influenced or how we are persuaded by the world. And sometimes those situations where we're persuaded by others are parcel of living in the world we have today. I mean, we have lots of people that are actively trying to persuade us. Every time you see a, an ad or a commercial or some sort of marketing piece, it's trying to get you to take action. It's trying to get you to engage with a particular brand. So there's lots of examples of situations where we are bombarded with efforts to persuade us, efforts to influence us. And in this particular episode, I want to talk about the situations where we don't really get much out of it. In other words, we're scammed by the situation. But to start off with, let's talk about a, a question that I love talking about. I love pondering, which is why do we believe what we believe? Now in the book that I'm working on at the moment, which is all about beliefs, we'll dive into this in depth to explore how this works. But in a nutshell, we believe to survive. So our brains are prediction machines. So your brain basically to keep you alive needs to figure out what's going on in the world. And to do so, it takes in information through your senses. It figures out what's happening in your body and it uses your memories or your concepts to make a prediction as to what do you expect is going to happen next. And in order to do so, in order to survive, it needs to make sure its predictions are as good as possible. So it predicts things. It gives you the requisite actions you need to take. And hopefully that's enough to keep you alive. And the miracle is, is that it does keep us alive for a long, long time in many cases. So your brain's job is to make predictions. Now, when your brain makes these kinds of predictions, it's doing so in such a way that it's trying to understand how the world works. So we're desperately looking for and searching for certainty, because if I can get certainty in my brain, then I know that I can make better predictions. I know if I do A, it's going to lead to B. Therefore, I'm going to keep doing A with the comfort and the knowledge that it's going to lead to B. So we love the idea that our predictions are accurate and that makes us feel more certain. And so we build up and develop beliefs as a result of this. So we believe 
that A will lead to B because we, again, predicted A will lead to B. We do it. It does. And this happens a number of times and we start to form a belief. And this is really where we get knowledge from. The beliefs that, I suppose, translate into knowledge are the beliefs that we have enough evidence behind that we suggest, yes, this is definitely 100% true. Unfortunately, a lot of things that we believe, we mix them up for knowledge and we think that this is knowledge because we feel we've enough evidence. However, as I'm sure we've talked about in previous episodes, not all evidence is created equal. So therefore, you might think you've a lot of evidence, but actually when you look into it, it's not as reliable evidence as you might think on first study or on first inspection. So oftentimes we think we know something, but we actually believe it. It's a degree of certainty that we feel. And Robert Burton, great researcher, has a book, I think it's called On Being Certain, but basically talks about how certainty and beliefs are a feeling of certainty. So when you believe something, you feel certain about it. And he identifies that it really is about the feeling as opposed to us thinking that we logically came to this conclusion because we evaluated all the evidence for and against or whatnot. So it's a feeling of knowing is what uh, Robert Burton describes it as. So how do we get beliefs? And to answer this question again, we, we have to dive into the notion that I've discussed before in this podcast is that we get beliefs from the stories that we tell ourselves about why what's happening is happening. So we experience something, we see what's happening, and immediately our brain, our propaganda machine, goes in to tell us a story about what's going on. So our brain will tell us, this is what's happening, and this is why it's happening. And the story that we tell ourselves about the experience is exactly what cultivates the beliefs that we hold about that experience. So we experience something, and then our brain starts to kick off the storytelling machine. And before you know it, we now have a very clear interpretation of what happened and why it happened and what it means. And the reason we do that is, again, if you think about it, there's no point in you witnessing experiences unless you can use those experiences to make better predictions. So when you experience something, you then are in a better position to make a prediction, not because the experience happened, but because you made it mean something or you created a causal connection so that you said, oh, because this happened, this means this, or this event happened, this is why it happened, therefore this is likely to happen now in the future. So our brains tend to cultivate or create stories that allow us to make sense of what experiences that we're having. Now, with beliefs, once again, our beliefs don't just come from the logical experience we have. There's a, a notion called effective realism, which is the idea that based on how we feel, we see the world in a certain way. So we have these emotional beliefs, if you will, so that when you're feeling a certain way, if you're very angry, you see the world differently than if you're very sad, you see the world differently than if you're very calm. So based upon how you feel, you will be telling yourself different stories because your feelings, it's almost like the feelings are the DJs or the radio announcers or the speakers. These are the people that will be interpreting whatever's going on, the narrators. So when you're feeling angry, the narrator will be doing what he can, she can, they can, to make you feel more angry. When you're calm, the narrator will probably be pretty calm. When you're depressed, the narrator will probably be pretty down and explaining why this is awful. So based on how we feel, that feeling tends to trigger the kind of voices that are speaking inside our mind in such a way that they bring us into that state more and more and more. And they try to maintain that state as long as possible. And I bring you through all of this because in order for us to understand why we fall for things, we need to fundamentally understand why we're receptive or open to the messages in the first place. So often we have what Robert McKee, the wonderful story writing guru calls our conscious desires, but we have our unconscious drives. So our conscious desires is what we know we want, but our unconscious drives are what deep down subconsciously we're trying to achieve or we're trying to get. And, you know, Freud talked about the, the sexual desire or the sexual drive, the aggression drive. And there's lots of these unconscious drives that oftentimes when they're in conflict with what we want, we sabotage ourselves. So consciously we want something, but we keep ruining it. Why? Well, it's probably because subconsciously there's a drive of trying to maintain stability. We don't want to take a risk. And even though that risk might lead to 
a wonderful relationship or a wonderful business opportunity. It's the fear and that drive underneath the surface that holds us back from taking the action we need to, that causes us to procrastinate or hesitate or whatnot. So we have to look at the fact that you've got these desires that you have, these unconscious drives, you've got your emotions and how that can affect the belief systems that you're holding on to at that moment. But primarily what occurs is a form of almost could be described as a hypnosis. It's like you're hypnotized. When you fall in love, for example, your entire decision-making is influenced by that. The beliefs that you hold and how you experience reality is influenced by that. And so being in love, being hypnotized, buying into a story about your country that you've been programmed in by watching a news channel, whether it's CNN or Fox News, and convinced that this is the way it is, where you demonize the other side and you idealize your own side. All of those are examples of almost like trances or hypnotic states that we're in, where we're very much influenced by what's going on. And so let's lead into how this makes us more susceptible to being fooled or being tricked or being conned. And the truth is, is that we have a natural bias to believe. This is known as the truth default theory. And in a nutshell, what it means is, is that our brains are wired to have a bias to automatically believe whatever it is that we hear. And if you think about it, it makes total sense. We automatically should believe whatever we hear, because if we don't, if we do the opposite of that, we're automatically skeptical. We can't have very much effective conversations. In other words, if you have to use a lot of brain power to be able to figure out if someone's telling the truth and you're naturally assuming that they're lying, then from a social connection perspective, it's going to be a disaster because you automatically assume everyone's lying. And number two, purely from an actual interaction or functional perspective, most of what people say is true. Most of what people say in the everyday conversations we have are correct or are accurate. And if we are having a bias, that means that we're naturally discounting or disbelieving everyone that can make things very troubling and very problematic for us down the line. Whereas on the flip side, if we have what we do have, which is the true default theory, where we naturally believe people, then we can have the skeptical mindset that comes out and then double checks it. That's a much quicker, much more efficient, much more effective way of us handling information. The problem is because of the true default theory, we're more likely to fall for scams than we would be if we were initially a lot more skeptical. Another factor that influences us is that we tend to generalize in terms of experts. So we create what I call the false authority effect. And that is that we often give authority to somebody, even though they don't, they haven't earned it. So because if there's a politician that says something, we might already give them a lot more credit than they deserve. We might assume that they're an expert because they have authority. We assume their authority gives them a level of expertise or competence, which it might not. And not just for politicians, this could also be, why do you believe your parent when your parent tells you that you'll never be able to be any good at this particular skill? We give them credit because we go, oh, they're my parent, they should know. Well, actually, they've no real way of knowing whether or not you can or can't be good at something. Even if they're your art teacher, they tell you, you know, good at art. That doesn't mean that you won't be any good at art. It just means that's their opinion. So all of that, I suppose, brings us down to recognizing that we're very quick to believe what we're told. And even if we are challenging it very quickly, so we don't fall for the scams, more often than not, there's a lot of people out there that will not have that skeptical mindset to kick in. In other words, there's a lot of people out there that are more susceptible to scams than others. And it's very easy for us to dismiss them and to go, oh, some people are so gullible. But the truth of the matter is, is that we're all gullible in our own way. And some of the most effective scams or some of the smartest scams are ways to make us more gullible by leveraging or using the same kind of mechanisms that magicians use to direct or affect our attention. And so we tend to, as soon as we get an idea or a feeling that something's true, we tend to learn our own strongman argument. And this is as a result of what we call the confirmation bias. This basically means we look for evidence to prove we were correct and we dismiss evidence that contradicts it. So we learn our own strongest man argument. In other words, we learn why what we believe is so strong and so convincing. And so once we get a wind of an idea and we decide we're going to believe it, we really do quickly learn, this is why I'm definitely correct. And we convince ourselves more and more. And polarization in many ways 
makes us more likely to buy into whatever it is that we believe in. So one of the functions of polarization is it makes people who believe in something, believe in it even more, right? Because it's creating a sort of dynamic where it's either A or B. So if you already believe in A, well, it makes you more double down. Because you're not going to believe in B. And when you realize there's only two choices, it makes you believe in A even stronger. We then also learn about the straw man version of other people's perspective. So if you believe in A and someone presents B, well, you'll be much more because you've been listening to other people that talk about A, you'll be, I suppose, given the straw man and the straw man argument is a very weak form of argument that can be easily broken down, but you'll be given that form of argument from another person. So the example I've heard people talk about before is like the gun lobby example. So let's say, for example, you're trying to get people to have more regulations for the gun lobby. And you're trying to do that in the States. And what the strongman argument would be if you go along and you go into the amount of deaths by guns and the fact that people, it's in certain places, it's very easy to get your hands on guns, all that sort of way. But if you're on the other side, if you're, for example, on the gun lobby side or on the freedom to bear arms side, what often you're going to do is you're going to be exposed to a straw man argument of the other side. In other words, the straw man argument would be, we want to ban guns entirely. And that's a very weak argument for those that want regulations for guns. But oftentimes that's what it becomes. So if I believe of the right to bear arms, I see the other side, they want to take our guns and we want to keep our guns. And that's the argument that I'm facing. Whereas if we flip it, the person who is on the side of I believe that there should be gun regulation. That's their strong argument, but they will see the other side where they will say, oh, they believe that everybody should be allowed to have a gun. So now what you have is you've got the two sides that are actually arguing over two different topics. And it's a wonder why they can't agree on anything, but it's because we often will take our own strongman argument. We'll notice the strongman argument that the other side has. And as a result of that, we'll become even more convinced in our own point of view. And we also get validation for believing in our own point of view. So when you decide on whatever your argument is and you got your strong man, you also will surround yourself with the echo chamber of other people, whether that's online and social media channels and, and echo chambers there, or it's in the communities or culture you surround yourself with. If you live in certain parts of America and you're exposed to a very liberal way of thinking, well, that's a totally different reality you're subjecting yourself to than if you're in a very conservative uh, area and if you're surrounded by very conservative people. So we tend to get validation from the groups that we find, our, we, we spend time around and we find ourselves spending time with. And that makes us even more certain with the ideas or the beliefs that we maintain. We also become the spreaders. So whenever we get a conspiracy theory or whenever we get something about you know, the other side, we tend to become very quick to buy in. So a few, a uh, couple of months ago, I interviewed a very dear friend of mine, Jess Pettit on the podcast, and we were talking about diversity. And one of the things we talked about is uh, the schools in the States, which I'd heard stories of where in these schools, uh, they were allowing the, the, the students to identify as cats and animals. And I was like, how ridiculous it is, blah, 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 blah. And what Jess said to me is, She's never actually had anybody that was able to tell her which school. People would say a friend of a friend, but if you actually look out to it, there's never been one documented case of that actually happening. Instead, it's just rumor after rumor after rumor. So it's easy to believe in it because it's fascinating. And it's to a degree, we, we spread it because it increases. It's entertaining. It makes people want to listen to us more and it makes people feel like they're more special because it. Let's say if I'm telling people about it, it makes me feel like I'm giving information that other people don't have exclusive information, which makes me come across better. Also, sensationalism is addictive. When you talk about something crazy like that, people want to talk about it. People want to know about it. It's drama. It's one of the reasons why soap operas are so popular. It's drama. And that kind of attention that you get from people when you're the one feeding it, it's addictive. And so you feel that your exclusivity You've got the exclusive information. You're the smartest, you know, person in the room. You're the brightest candle in the cake. That's addictive for people. And as we do it, we look to our actions to reinforce our beliefs. 
So before you know it, spreading this information makes us even more committed to that information as well. So this kind of explains why we believe in or buy into the ideas we do, why we fall for the conspiracy theories, why we fall for the political ideas, why we find ourselves polarized in the first place. And the next question and the real question we want to ask is, so what can we do? And again, there's a number of great examples. It's a wonderful book, The Nobody's Fool book, that you'll find lots of examples and take some of those. One of the things that they mention is a possibility grid. And let me just walk you through this and my understanding of this. So a good example is, let's say, for example, somebody is trying to get you to believe in betting on these horses and they take uh, a track record of their best expert on the horse races. And this expert turns around and says, this underdog I bet on and this underdog I bet on and this underdog I bet on and all of them came through. So they're telling you three examples where they were super successful. And immediately when we hear, oh my goodness, this person picked three underdogs and all of them were under horses. Do you get it? Three under horses and they all won. This person must have the genius. They must have the skill. They must have the incredible ability to be able to make these predictions. But it's because we're not really thinking about it in enough depth. So the possibility grid in this example would be you have at the top of the grid, let's say in four quadrants, and the top two quadrants, that would be everything that this person would recommend, this expert would recommend. And let's say on the left-hand side, you have things that they would recommend that did not work out, right? So things that they would recommend, all of the recommendations they made for horses to bet on where they got it wrong. Then you've got the top right-hand quadrant, which is everything that they recommended that did work out well. Then below the deck is things they didn't recommend. And in that, you have things they didn't recommend that didn't work, but then you have things that they didn't recommend that did work. In other words, horses that won, underdogs or under horses that did win, that they didn't predict would win. And so what often happens is when you're given an example by someone who's trying to convince you to do it, they will emphasize the top right-hand quadrant. They'll emphasize, look, this person picked this and this. Isn't that amazing? But they won't tell you about all of the picks that this person got wrong. And they won't tell you about all of the picks that this person didn't make, but came true as well. And because you don't have that data, you just have the data of the three things that they got right. You're more likely to assume this person gets everything right, or this person is amazing, super at this sort of stuff. So this possibility grid is a great way to exercise our own critical thinking and make us smarter. Another thing that's important is to understand that beliefs are beliefs. Just because you believe in something or you feel that this is true doesn't guarantee it is true. It's a belief that we have. And what we really need to understand is the difference between feelings and facts. And that means understanding a belief is a feeling. I feel sure about this, but you can't guarantee it. And when you can't guarantee it, you need to look for what is the actual evidence. And you're looking for the evidence that backs up what, what you're being told or what you're believing, but you're also looking for evidence that is against your feelings. So what is the evidence? How does the evidence contradict how you feel? And who believes something differently to you? And how could they potentially be right? So in other words, you're asking yourself, how could I potentially be wrong here? And it's not a question we're used to asking. It's not even a question that feels good, but when you ask the question, how could I be wrong here? And how does the evidence attack my perspective? You're almost preventing yourself from falling into confirmation bias because you're recognizing this is what I feel right now, but what's the actual evidence say? Both for and against, so you can make a more informed decision. When we talked about the straw man and the strongman argument, another thing to do is to look at the other person's, the other point of view, and try to look at their strong man argument. So instead of looking at, for example, like we talked about the, they just want to take away our guns, ask yourself, what is their real argument and what evidence do they have to back it up? So if you were to argue their point of view for them, what would that argument look like? And the reason you want to do that is because by doing so, it means you're going to be a lot more critical in evaluating the evidence because you want to understand the other person's strongest arguments. And the benefits are, if you maintain your own point of view, well, at least now, if you know what their strongest argument is, you'll be in a much better position to argue against it. 
You also want to know what are the weaknesses of your own argument. So what are the weaknesses of your argument? If I ever hear a person that says, I'm 100% certain of this, and they don't see any weaknesses in their argument, I'm already skeptical. Because if you're that certain, it implies to me that you haven't done the due diligence of really analyzing the facts and figures, the data. Because in my experience, we can't be too certain of anything in many ways. And if you don't believe me, read Plato when he talks about Socrates and, you know, learn about the, the Socratic dialogues and, and how Socrates asked questions to get people to realize that they were nearly as right as they thought that they were. Ask questions like, what is different to what I expect? Don't immediately assume that things are going to work out the way you expect them to, but start doubting your predictions and ask yourself, what surprises might I get? Or how might things work out differently to my expectations? Try to look for what you're missing here. What am I not seeing here? What, what evidence have I not collected? What factors am I not considering here? These kinds of questions enable us to be able to look around so that we don't fall for the idea and then convince ourselves very, very quickly. We're starting to be more critical in how we think about things. And if someone that you liked or someone on your side or someone in your group put forward an argument and you bought into it, ask yourself the question, what if the other side, what if someone you didn't like or didn't trust said the exact same thing? How would you think about that message differently? And I know you might think to yourself, oh, I think the same. Trust me, we don't. What we tend to do is we evaluate who's saying whatever it is that they're saying before we decide whether or not we're going to believe it. We're influenced, as I mentioned on a previous podcast, we're influenced by the peripheral route of persuasion, the system one, the automatic way of thinking, the feelings. So what we want to do is ask ourselves the question, if someone that we disliked put forward this argument, how we think about it differently? And when we think about the other perspective that we disagree with, ask ourselves if someone we respected, liked, and believed put forward that argument that we disagree with, how would we think about it then? We need to look at this false authority and ask ourselves, are the people that I learned this from qualified, really qualified to talk about it and really qualified to convince me on it? Have they done enough? Just because they're an expert in one space, just because they're a physicist doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about when it comes to psychology. Just because they're a psychologist doesn't mean they know when it comes to physics, what the right thing to do is. So we have to ask ourselves, do they have the authority? We have to look at, to, I suppose, reduce the sensationalism. We have to go, what is the most likely, but yet boring or normal potential reality here? Where the most normal or most boring part of our argument, what is it that is most likely to be true? that isn't that exciting or entertaining. Because once again, when we think about it from that point of view, we're reducing the likelihood of something exciting that we can tell lots of people. We also want to ask something along the lines of, how can I be more accurate and more responsible in communicating what I know? In other words, to avoid us spreading all this drama, how can I be more responsible and more accurate in communicating so that we avoid falling into the trap of dramatizing, exciting things because it makes us come across more charismatic? That's great, but when it comes to unduly influencing people in a negative way with some sort of conspiracy theory or some sort of idea that we want to get other people to believe in, we have to be much more responsible in, in the way we communicate. And, and, and vice versa, when someone spreads it to us, we need to be able to ask ourselves, what questions can I ask them when they're trying to tell me something that reduces my likelihood of falling for it? How can I activate my skeptical mindset when someone tries to spread an idea to me so I don't immediately just assume it? So there might be the true default initially, but then how can I immediately ask questions that prevent me from falling for something that might not be helpful or empowering for me down the line? So in many ways, in order for us to be able to avoid falling for stuff, and I, I'm not just talking about scams, I'm not just talking about conspiracy theories, I'm talking about falling for ideas that are not useful. We first of all need to identify how are we influenced by the world and what is it that makes us more likely to be receptive to these ideas. We have to be on the lookout and have suggestions or questions, which I've just gone through, which can help us test the ideas and ensure that if we do decide to believe in something and we do decide to communicate about that something, we've done our due diligence and we've tested them and we've 
given ourselves the opportunity to really think about them and investigate them. Adam Grant, in his great book, Think Again, talks about the different ways that we can approach ideas. So you can be the preacher or the politician, right? Or you can be the scientist, right? So you have the preacher who is telling you how great things are. There is the prosecutor, sorry, is the second one where you challenge other people's ideas. There's the politician where you agree with whoever's ideas out there. And then there's the scientist. The scientist evaluates and weighs up the arguments of different sides to try to understand what's really going on. And if we can become more like scientists, which these questions will help you to do, which the Socratic questions even will help you to do, it makes sure that you're evaluating things a lot more effectively. And that, therefore, you'll be less likely to fall for other people's perspective, whether it's your friend, your family, whether it's scam artists, whoever it is. The only ones that I would suggest that it's not a good idea to stop falling for would be the magicians because they're entertaining and they're fun. And then some of the greatest screenwriters or authors in their own way are magicians because they usurp our expectations beautifully and surprise us that way. But whenever it comes to people trying to manipulate us or affect us, it's crucial that we learn these kind of skills and we prevent ourselves falling for the same old tried and tested techniques that leverage how our brains work in this way. So hope you found this useful. Hope you found this interesting, but for now, take care, please spread the word. Let lots of people know about the change of minds podcast and continue to move forward. May the force continue to be with you and may you continue to believe better. Bye for now.